anyway, uh, some cooperating agencies on this, uh, the Natural Resource Damage Program, US EPA, Butte Sewer Bowl Creek Greenway, and on this one, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. So site location, Durant Canyon, if you head west of town to Ramsey, wrap around a miles crossing road, you look downstream, that's Durant Canyon. Also, the, the other end of Durant Canyon is like you go to Fairmont Hot Springs, take Fairmont Road, you cross Silbo Creek and look upstream, you're looking right at the project area, you're looking up into Durant Canyon. So what I want to convey um, in this presentation is just how tight the constraints of the canyon are. Not only is it a canyon, you can see that the topography here, it's, it's very steep, very confined, very narrow. Um, but also we have three railroads running through the canyon, two active, BNSF and Raris, and one historic railroad, the Milwaukee Railroad grade, which if you've ever been like the Hiawatha Trail out of Kellogg or, or up on the peak there, it's um, part of that historic railroad. The highlighted areas you can see here are, are tailings deposits. So really tough to get at, really tough to excavate. Um, not a lot of it, but, but very expensive and not, ex um, not really efficient excavation operations. Just a little bit about Butte's history and how this all came about, you know, 100 years of mining gener generated an awful lot of waste and uh, mine tailings. And um, how did this all get deposited downstream? Well, there was a flood of epic proportions in 1908 that basically blew tailings all the way down from Mill, all the way, from Butte all the way down to Milltown. And, uh, kind of some cartoony stuff where I haven't seen anything like this since Noah's time, those kind of things, it, it was big. So a little bit of project history. In, in, in 1983, uh, Bowl Creek was des designated as an MPL on the MPL list uh, and designated as the Streamside Tailings Operable Unit. In 1995, there is a record is, of decision to basically remove the tailings t to the limits of the 100-year floodplain and in 1999, a settlement was reached between uh, ARCO and the state for 80 million plus interest to fund the cleanup for DEQ and EPA. So this is an aerial of where we are, Butte, and way downstream, it's about 26 miles of river to clean up. Um, all the tailings are shipped via rail to the Opportunity Ponds Waste Management Area. Um, the Drant Canyons project's about right in the middle So this is a typical tailings deposit. We're looking at about three to four feet of tailings here in Durant County. We ran into some deposits that were like 15 feet plus deep of tailings. So what are, what are we looking at here? Arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, zinc, mercury. The rod has really specific targeted removal, remedial action objectives, and there's a lot of confirmation sampling that goes into it. It's like after you excavate this, you do field confirmation sampling, secondary laboratory sampling to make sure that you're getting your, your, your you're removing it, excavating what you need, and meeting the remedial action objectives defined in the rod. It's a little easier to do this when you have a big, expansive floodplain to work with where you can just grid it out and test pit and really characterize the area. And in the confines of this canyon, we really didn't have that opportunity because you can't just run in there with an excavator. You can't, you can't, you, you know, you can't cross the creek. Difficult access, um, so we really had a, limited characterization data, limited test pit data, and Pioneer didn't actually do the characterization data, so we kind of inherited it. So we just kind of had to roll with the punches and, and take what we were given and design kind of a flexible design package to account for field conditions. Um, and another thing that the client, uh, DEQ, they, they felt like they'd already put enough money into characterization, so really the, their objective was, hey, let's get something out on the street, let's account for the variability that we're, gonna, that we're gonna have in the field in our design package, and then roll with the punches in the field rather than do a bunch more characterization and, and still end up doing all that anyway. So as an engineering firm, it's always better to have more data, more data, more data, but sometimes you just don't have that. Um, so we had to be conservative in our excavation depths, I mean, you know, sometimes our test pits might be 300 feet apart and we're trying to interpolate, like, what, are the, what is our tailings deposit between these two, those two test pits? If it's three foot here and five foot here and you draw a line between them, you might miss a bunch in between it, those kind of things. So how did we account, how did we do this? We, 
we measured all the tailings that came out of there via rail car. So it's like a, a rail car, as you know, it's, it's a cubic area that we can actually quantify for what came off the site. Another thing I'll touch on later is GPS controlled ops and how much I like them and sometimes dislike them. But this is a typical excavation area. When the contractor's in there actually working and excavating tailings, a lot of times it's just kind of like a bomb went off. So it's like, how do you quantify, you know, they get paid by the cubic yard for how much tailings are actually removed from the site. Well to, well, to quantify that can be really difficult. If you look at this, I mean, the trucks are sinking through the mud and stuff like that. So for a surveyor to go, surveyor to go in there and try to topo that area and get a secondary surface excavation to figure out how much volume's leaving the site would be really difficult and really expensive. So we put it all in the train car, measure it by the train car, and then not only that, but like if we're missing some, we can just say, you know, our field confirmation sampling says you're missing a zone of tailings here. Dig an extra two feet out of here, put it in the train car, and then that gets paid rather than us doing a bunch of measurement in the field that just ends up costing the client a bunch of money. So the sequence of advance is basically excavate the tailings, haul it to a loadout area, load it on the train, the train ships to the Opportunity Ponds Waste Management Area that I showed you earlier. They offload it there and take it to a laydown area. Lessons learned in contracting and construction. Well, we're dealing with a low bid environment. So, you know, it's, it's really cutthroat and competitive with these contractors. You know, there's, there's a number of them out there that do this type of work. Um, this particular project had a lot of infrastructure in it in terms of pipe diversions and embankment protections, gabions, riprap, actually designed engineering features. So to account for that, and knowing what we know about working with contractors through our 20 year history, for my 20 year history working with contractors, it's, it's always better to design for the worst case scenario up front and then maybe back off a little bit in the field rather than the other way around because that just leads you to change orders and change orders are expensive and, and uh, not only are they kind of a black eye for the engineer sometimes but also for our client. So knowing what I know about contractors, I've worked with good ones, I've worked with really bad ones and most of these contracts I write are for the bad ones because you know I look at how do I specify the work and how do I think they're gonna take a shortcut for that work to try to make money and uh, so I'm playing devil's ag advocate all the time. Um, if I'm doing that and I over design a little bit it gives me the option to be a little bit to back off a little bit in the field to work with these contractors when they're approaching me it's like Pierre can I do it this way instead it's like usually I just say no and then if they make a good case for it, I try to work my way to yes. And I'm not the kind of guy that says, um, I know more than the contractor all the time. If they have a better idea than, than me, then I'm open to that. And uh, if, if you can get some win-wins like that, then you have a better working relationship. So it's just kind of a, a good way to go about things. Um, for this one, I want to convey that it's better to find, for your engineering students out there, it's better to find a minimum depth and measure in square yards and or like acres than like a cubic yardage. So if I'm going to protect an embankment with riprap and my scour calculations say you need a foot and three quarters of type one riprap on that embankment. Well, I'm gonna specify probably two feet and then I'm just gonna pay on the plan area. So the contractor is required to place two feet over a given area. If they place over two feet, it's just a bonus for me. It's a bonus for my client. If they place a foot and three quarter, I know in the back of my mind that that meets design specifications and I might be a little bit lenient and say, well, you know, you owe me one down the road. So it's a good card to have in your back pocket. Um, in terms of engineering features, it's better to design and pay for diversions and things like that up front or infrastructure. It's better to, just to design it than leave those kind of things on the contractor to do. Um, in terms of like moving muck from point A to point B, all of those means and methods, it's way better to leave on the contractor because that's what they do best. Some of them have like, they might have the, just the perfect type of equipment for your particular job and it gives them a competitive advantage so they can bid it for less money and actually, it, and it actually stays, uh, saves the state money by doing so. All right, so let's get into the meat and bones of this, the fun part. So here's Durant Canyon. Here's just a typical example. We see two railroads and an abandoned railroad embankment. Everything along the stream channel is, is uh, tailings impacted soils, and DEQ's mantra is tailings is tailings, and tailings must go. So how can we get 
How can we remove all these tailings? You can see this grass and stuff, that's red top, which is a good, in, a good indicator of a, a mine waste or impacted material. How, how can we get the tailings out of there? EPA won't let you work in the active stream channel for obvious reasons. So we decided that we were gonna create a pipe stream diversion right down the middle of the channel. Well, the challenge of that, I think for starters, is how, how big a pipe do you use, you know? If, you, if the pipe's too small, you, it won't carry the capacity of the creek. If the pipe's too big, it's expensive, it's difficult to work around, it's hard to move, those kind of things. So what did we do for, to size the pipe? We looked at all the historical data for flow in Silver Bow Creek, and we decided that after about July 15th, flow would be around 100 CFS or a little bit less. So we decided to use a 42 inch HDPE diversion pipe that would carry 110 CFS. We needed this pipe right during the middle of the Bakken boom. And we're a little bit worried about it, so we actually did a separate procurement for the pipe itself. These pipe came in, pipe came in, in 55 foot lengths and brought it to the site and then we, they fused it. You fuse this pipe together with heat welds. They fused it into 330 feet sections and 660 feet sections. So I'm kind of a begin with the end in mind, guys. So here's the pipe in the creek. And you know, on one side of the embankment, they're mining tailings. On the other side of the embankment, they're, uh, they're reducing the slope and they'll re -veg it. Next to the railroad, they're installing gabions. So how did we get the water in the pipe, I guess, is, is, is the question. So we installed big diversion dikes right in the middle of the channel with an earthen core, put pipes through the core, compacted around the earthen core, put some rock shell material around that, some fabric around that, and some riprap over that. Over-engineered, probably, but if you get that gully washer in August, the last thing you want is for things to blow out and it to ruin your project. So this is built hell for stout, if you will, for that event. So this is a sequence of, what you see on this, this longer gray line is, uh, that's our 42 inch pipe. On the, on the left is a stormwater relief culvert, which is 40 inch, 48 inches. Both, is, both those, go, those go right through the dike, and, and both of those have head gates on them. So we have this, this, this dike in this pond area on the upstream end of it. We close the head gates, so that stops all your flow. And then you put 330 feet of pipe in, couple it together. By that time, your pond's about to the top of your dike. You open your head gates, let all the water bleed downstream, close the head gates and start over again. So section by section by section, you're working your way downstream, putting in this pipe. And this is just a sequence of events for installing the pipes and the diversion dike itself. Um, the one on the right, so bottom, bottom right, there's a completed um, diversion dike but a fair amount of work to get these things in. And then this is just a typical sequence of um, taking the tailings out, working around the pipe. So it really is a, a, a nice size of pipe for this particular application, and it was pretty cool to see that you can actually fit the creek in the pipe. I just want to give you an example of this head gate. This one's a little bit backwards of what I just showed you. For whatever reason, they, they wanted to put the head gate on the downstream end. We're looking downstream. But just to convey the dewatered work area. Um, and and uh, I guess I wanted to, yeah, this, this particular knife gate valve is around 40 grand. The pipe itself was about 100 bucks a linear foot. This is that same work area. I'm looking kind of across and upstream a little bit. Um, we're installing gabion uh, embankment protection for the railroads, infrastructure protection. On one side, we're, we have a little bit of a floodplain here. We're excavating tail, tailings, regrading the floodplain, placing vegetated backfill or cover soil, with, if you will, over that. Constructing stream banks, there's, there's a lot going on here. This is looking upstream at that same area. After one growing season, um, you can see the gabions and riprap on, on the embankment and some bank construction on one side. So I went over those slides in about, what, 30 seconds? It took about four months to do this. Logan, four months? Okay, <laughs> maybe a little more. Uh, lessons learned on contractor substitutions. You know, it's like, uh, this is one where the contractor knows more than the engineer. 
So they, they said, well, you know, we've, we've installed, installed miles and miles of this pipe and we've always used these couplers. They're not what you spec'd out, but we've used them and they work. So we're like, okay, well, it's on you, go for it. So they used these couplers to couple the pipe together and it worked pretty good throughout the summer. But in the fall when it started to get really cold in the canyon, uh, the temperatures dropped and that pipe, 1,500 feet of pipe, or <laughs> when it gets cold it contracts, so it was pulling the part, pipe apart at, you know, at the couples, so we'd get there in the morning and water would be bleeding everywhere. So they ended up kind of strapping it together and pulling it together and then they had to bury hundreds of linear feet of this pipe to insulate it and, um, and then of course unbury it when they were all done and stuff like that. So. Um, did they send, save a bunch of money with their shortcut? No, it probably cost them quite a bit of money. So this is the right way to do it. Um, this is the end of, of like a 300, 300 foot section of pipe. It has this flange with this backup ring assembly so that when they actually put the pipes together, these, these big sections of pipe, they can couple them together and here's a typical detail. It's all bolted together and, and then they hold. So. I learned something on that too. This was a little bit larger diversion. We did four, four pipe diversions in this project. This one was pretty extensive. It was about 1.4 miles long of that about 4,500 feet pipe diversion. And then at the end, like I was saying before, when you go to Fairmont, you look upstream, there was a little bit more expansive floodplain. We had some room to work with, so we were able to transition from the pipe diversion to an open channel diversion in that area. I think we had, what, 2,600 linear feet of open channel diversion. And right smack dab in the middle, we had a fish barrier installation. So really, I guess what I want to convey more than anything is it's not cheap to do these diversions, those kind of things, but all of this work up front, this time and expense and effort to get your water out of the way, you save it on the tail end when you actually go into your excavation area and you regrade and you're doing your, all your restoration and reclamation work. And it just makes it so much easier when your water's kind of out of the way. Not all of it, there's springs and stuff like that that you need to do some pumping and stuff like that, but um, for the most part, you move the river, do the reclamation, build new river, put the river back. So this is, uh, I think, what I wanted to show in, in this slide is just a sequence of events of putting these dikes in, and you can just see the area dry out through this progression of photos. In some areas, it, it wasn't very easy to keep this thing on grade. We had to drill and blast and put the pipe in a, you know, a trench, those kind of things. So that was kind of fun. Not big sections, but we did have to, we did have to create some room to stay on grade. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying before about how much time and effort and money to get the stream diverted away from your work area, away from the waste excavation area. Um, a lot of work up front, but save you a lot of time on the tail end of things. Uh, this is just an example of this open diversion area. We had a little bit more room in that area. Um, typical channel design. I'm just showing you that because, you know, the engineers sometimes screw up too. We had this channel design for the capacity of the channel plus a little bit extra and things like that. And then we had I think 14 days of below zero weather, and we had one little bit of a flat spot in this channel, so it ice jammed on us and overflowed, so engineers make mistakes too. This isn't the best sequence of photos, but it just kind of gives you an idea of the expanse of this, of this diversion system. This Google flew this thing right during construction, so it's kind of cool to look at. Going from upstream to down, you can see the pipe, the, the dikes and the pipe diversion. You can see us building a fish barrier right in the middle. You can see it transitioning to the open channel, which we don't have quite done here, but there's a lot going on in these photos. And Google's cool for that reason, just not only for this project, but for a streamside project in particular, from here all the way to Opportunity Pond, you can follow Silver River Creek and look at the historical imagery back over the last 15 years and see what's been done and how things have changed. Um, not only in terms of the waste that's gone, but you know, what the river used to be just a be basically a big ditch and now it's more of a, a sinuous, natural flowing stream channel. It, it's just pretty cool to do that. Uh, stream channel construction lessons learned is, um, throughout this talk I'll, I'll kind of I'll harp on this, to have multiple tools and treatments to apply to changing conditions in the field, um, to preserve the existing stream bed where possible. There's sections of stream channel out there in this canyon that were just absolutely 
beautiful. Even though there were tailings on the limits of the channel, the stream channel was really cool itself. A lot of little drop structures and step pools and things that were great for fish habitat. And it's like, as a design, design professional, it's like I look at that and I'm like, I can't beat that. I can't do better than that. I want to preserve that. So I'll kind of show you a little bit about that. Um, in terms of building the channel itself, engineers, um, I guess if I had to offer advice, maybe maybe don't over-engineer a little bit when it comes to rock gradations and things like that. We've, we've looked at different stream channel designs that have like six different rock gradations and the gradations are just a little bit apart. So it's a matter of finding happy medium so that you can find commercially available rock that isn't so hard to generate. So these are just typical details for stream construction. I think a typical would be, you know, a riffle, a run, and a pool. Um, in this case, we have like a bank construction only where we, we don't want, where we know we have to take contaminants away from the edge of the stream, but where we have grade and we have rock, all the contaminants have basically blown downstream, it's clean, and we can work with what we have there. And this is a pretty good example of that. You can see the really rocky substrate that we just didn't want to ruin there. We're building bank only in this section. This is a section where we're actually building new stream channel. This is all imported stream rock. You can see it's rounded. That's really good, better for the fish than angular, which just cuts up their bellies and stuff like that. So like as we move from right to left, we're looking at a pool, a short riffle run, and another pool section. So this is all new channel construction. And this is an example of, I'm looking upstream here, a, a transition from where we utilize the existing, existing stream bed and then, we draw, and then we change to actually new channel construction. Probably, and, and probably in this area, I think it was is more of like what was going on with the tailings around that area. It's like we probably had a really deep excavation and we just had to take everything out. It's not like you can, you can excavate on the sides of it and leave, leave the tailings in underneath it. Everything has to go to keep things on grade. So this next segment, it's, it's going to be a little hard to understand out of context, but especially for your engineering students, I want to I wanna convey kind of a, a tool toolbox approach to design so that um, maybe if you take something away from this, it's, it's, it's a way not to paint yourself in a corner, if you will, in terms of setting up a contract and designing things such that you don't have a bunch of change orders in the field to, to uh, account for um, variable field conditions, which you will. So what I want to convey from this series of, of uh, typical details is that this is an embankment treatment that I would use for, I know I'm going to be right, for 900 linear feet along the slope. This is what we're going to install. It's going to be a bigger type 2 riprap at, at the toe, some top dressing type 1 riprap. It's going to have some gabion baskets. It's going to have some compacted um, backfill to get us on slope and on grade. And, and some fabrics and things like that. But what I want to convey here is that this thing isn't set up so that it's like it's bid out per linear foot. They have to, they have to, the plans call that they build this from station to station per linear foot, but everything is bid separately. So each of these rip wraps, gabions, type one rip wrap, type two rip wrap, backfill, fabric, they're all bid separately. And they're all measured and paid separately. So here's our tool box. This is all I want. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but all I want to take, all I want you to take away from this is that we help all these different tools. And then what I talked about earlier, you see that SY? That's everything's measured in square yards. So everything's measured on a plan area at a given thickness, a given depth, those kind of things. And it makes things so much easier in the field to measure and pay that way. Then have contracts disputes like a contractor would say, well, I, you know, I brought in 5,000 cubic yards of riprap and you're only paying me for 4,000. It's like, well, no. I'm paying you for a plan area and that's it. As long as you're installing to, a, to the required depth, to the required design spec, that's all we really care about. So you don't, it, it just, you're not painting yourself in a quarter and you're not running into disputes. So these are just more tools in the toolbox. All of these are measured and paid separately. Even though I'm probably going I probably have this spec'd out to do like this, this particular embankment treatment for like maybe 500 feet. It's paid on the plan area, not the linear feet. So, um, so it gives you a little more flexibility to make changes in the field. So you see all these different cross or all these different hatch patterns. If I run into an area where I'm wrong, because like sometimes 
every 10 feet is a little bit different on there. I have all these little puzzle pieces I can use to say, okay, I can use this, I can use gabions, I can use riprap, I can use uh, a different rock cover to make those changes in the field. And if I do, the, there's a mechanism in your contract for the, to, for the contractor to get paid for each one of those little puzzle pieces rather than writing a big change order to you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. In the field, you're just, you're, you're just going to say, well, instead of rock, rock toe there, or, or instead of like a, a rounded rock, put, rip rock, put a angular rip wrap in or, or something along those lines. I'll show you just a few examples so you kind of get what I'm trying, trying to drive home here. Uh, this would, uh, so look at these gabions. It's like we have a different slope length. You can see there's a little bit longer slope length, and it transitions down to a shorter slope length. So instead of me having two typical details for that type of slope length, I'm just paying for more area. It's, it's an easy deal. On this one, I have a transition zone between bank construction and a rock outcropping where I'm putting some riprap in. We're just paying for, we're just, we're just telling the contractor, put this type of detail in there. You get paid on the plan area. We're happy. We're good to go. So came to a restoration seminar. I'll talk a little bit about that too. So, um, this is a typical floodplain re uh, regrading cross section, and it is just that typical. Um, a lot of our designs in the past, or some of the things I've worked on, it's like, well, this is what the contractors kind of held to. It's like, well, just do this more or less. You're at a ten to one, and then transition to a one percent and grade it to the, you know, tie it into existing topography. And I don't really like that. It, it never really turns out the way that you envision it. So instead of that. In terms of creating a more natural floodplain and stream channel corridor, I actually think it's good to spend a lot more time on your floodplain. So this is an example of a, a more expansive tailings deposit where you have the river next to the railroad, which you don't really want. You want to get your river away from the railroad so it doesn't tear it all up when you have flood events. You want to create a natural stream channel with more sinuosity, a restored stream, stream channel, um, a more functional floodplain, if you will, and to do that, you have to build your floodplain, which isn't exactly easy. If you look at this cross section on the bottom, that looks a little bit, if you look a little bit like that typical section I just showed you, but we have a lot of, the, all that red is cut material and all the green is fill materials, so we have some really deep fill areas, some areas that we have to take material away from. All this colorful stuff on the top is just <laughs> fill zones, cut zones, everything to make you know this, this this functional floodplain that grades away from the channel, those kind of things. So a lot of deep cut zones, a lot of deep fill zones. So when I, before we bid these projects, I give a presentation to the contractors, contractors that are going to bid the project, just like I'm giving this presentation to you. And I, I show them a slide like this. It's like after you get the tailings out of the way and everything's clean, you have to build your floodplain. And it's not just a matter of a guy getting in a dozer and smearing things around and, you know, we think that's what the floodplain should look like. No. We provide them a design surface and say, you're building to these contours, so they're going to be hauling things in from areas, hauling things away from areas, grading things around to get things on grade and just how we want them to look. And I hammer it home because I want everyone to bid it right. It's not like, well, we put you know, $400 an acre into floodplain regrading when it should have been $4,000 an acre into floodplain regrading, those kind of things. So I hammer it home. We're tied on our tolerance. As everything that they do, I'm going to say you have to be within two-tenths of a foot or you're we're not going to pay for it. So here's an example where I like the GPS operations because we give them our floodplain regrading surface and they're out there and they're building this surface that we gave them. They're designing, they're, they're, building, to give, they're building to this topography that we want, that we envision, that we design. And it works great. Surveyor doesn't, you know, the surveyor will go out there and check on them, but for the most part, it's pretty efficient. It's pretty cost effective. The only thing I don't like about GPS operations is if you screw up in your design, that's what they're going to build. I mean, if you have a low area or an area that isn't draining in the right direction, they're looking at a screen in their dozer. They're not, you know, they're not looking out their window at that point in time to see what they're actually building. So you want to make sure you get it right. And when you do, it looks like this, which is, I think, uh, restoration at its finest. a functional floodplain, new stream channel corridor, and a pretty cool example of restoration from a an area that didn't look so good before. This fish barrier installation. So the objective of fish barrier on Silverbill Creek and Durant Canyon was to isolate native cutthroat trout in the upper reaches of Silverbill Creek. So to do this, we 
uh, designed and constructed a 50 foot wide by 22 foot high fish barrier. Um, we couldn't just put a dam in the middle of the channel and pond water behind it because sediment transport, to move sediment from upstream to downstream is really important for a functional stream channel. Um, I could talk a little bit more about that, but I'm not really have too much time, but, but it's important that you're not just creating a quagmire with a pond and stuff like that. That sediment needs to, needs to move through the system for a stream to be healthy and functional and, and do what it's supposed to do. So we had to place a, a lot of rock behind the fish barrier structure. Uh, we had a subcontractor working on this, so we had a pretty good relationship with our contractor, but the subcontractor was a little bit subpar, so we had to watch them quite a little bit, and it took quite a little while to get them on track. And this was quite a little bit of work to get everything formed and in place and everything on grade and those kind of things. This, these are isometric views of the fish barrier. I'll show you. And this is the installed structure. So, look, look pretty easy. Well, it really wasn't. So, <laughs> there's about 100 cubic yards of of concrete in this thing, so a lot of form work, a lot of a lot of finish work, those kind of things, uh, and kind of dangerous, really, with all the rebar and stuff, and guys running around on scaffolding and those kind of things. So, but a pretty dry work area, so uh, made things a lot easier. So I'm kind of running out of time here, so we'll do a little bit of show and tell. Uh, these are before, during, and after series of photos. This is upper reach jam. We're looking upstream. Things going on. That's about one growing season. It really takes about three to four growing seasons before things really, um, before you really have that kind of ecosystem that you're really seeking. And sometimes that means reseeding, refertilizing, those kind of things. Um, depends on how much rainfall you're getting, um, what your falls and springs are like, those kind of things. This is that same area and just a sequence of before, during, and after. Pretty cool example of restoration. This is kind of mid canyon. Pretty neat sequence of some different tools we're using, stream bank construction. We left kind of things as they were before, but all the nasty stuff's gone. This is downstream. I'm, I'm actually, we're looking upstream here. This sequence of events uh, before, when things are piped, bank construction, new, new new channel, and this is looking downstream, kind of the same sequence of events. This is a fish barrier area, before, during, and after. And this is that area just above Fairmont Road. You can see the open channel diversion area. Um, this is a pretty large scale tailings excavation area, floodplain regrading area, stream channel construction. And in addition to that, we also constructed uh, new, new wetland complex pond that you can see when you look upstream from Fairmont Road that um, the birds just love. And a little bit of new stream channel there. So our end game is really this. It's just, you know, generate really good habitat for wildlife and some really awesome recreation opportunities for people around here. The main conclusion from this is just that teamwork amongst all parties was the key to success. I mean, it wasn't a deal where the engineer was the bad guy or the contractor was the bad guy. It's like, I think everyone really bought into this, like, we really want to make this project shine. So it, it ended up being a, a great resume builder for, uh, for Helena Sand. It's a, it's a showcase project for Pioneer and also for DEQ, and uh, we're pretty proud of it, actually. Um, Another thing I'd say is that we invite you to look up Pioneer Technical on YouTube. We have some, uh, a slideshow on this project that's a little more expansive than what I gave today, but kind of give you more of a view of, of what went on down there. And, and also to visit our website to see some other cool things that we're doing around, not only in Montana, but the US. So and that's pretty much the end of my presentation. I really appreciate you inviting me to speak. So. Questions? So is the project completed then? Yeah. This, this, it, it really isn't. Um, Greenway Service District is working on that. Um, we are still using 
um, a little area in the canyon to ship by rail for some, some, some additional cleanup that we're doing upstream. So that's dangerous for public access. Um, but Greenway's working on some uh, agreements with landowners and the railroads to eventually open up, I, their objective is to eventually open up the canyon for, you know, uh, trail use all the way to Fairmont, so. Yeah. How many more years do you suppose that'll be before the public has access to that? All the way through the canyon? Yeah. I wish I had a, a good answer for that. I would, honestly, I would probably guess five. Hopefully before then, but, yeah. I say that because I know that their next construction contract will be using that railroad area, and that'll probably be a two-year contract. And in that time, I think Greenway will probably move forward with their access agreements. I think that, I mean, I think you could still float the river technically under Montana law, but you'd have to portage around the fish, bar fish barrier and some culverts and stuff in place. But I know they're really working toward it, but I, I, don't, I don't work for Greenway, so I don't know. Yeah. Can you reuse or were you able to sell all of that piping? Yeah, we're using it on another project, uh, the Upper Blackfoot Mining Club Complex right now, another diversion up there. And so the state owns the pipe, the state of Montana does. But there's a number of projects around where people are really interested in, in what we've done here and that they'd like to use the pipe on, that, on their projects again. Of course, to, you know, we, we cut it all up. They moved it up there and they're fusing it again. So it's <laughs> as they move, as we keep moving it from site to site, the pipes will get a little shorter all the time. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there's quite a bit, quite a little bit of it, you know, mile of pipe almost. So, yes. How, how many bidders did you have at the start? Uh, this one probably eight. And, and how regional were they? Um, I would say six of those were from Montana, mm -hmm. and two from the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 What's the uh, projected lifespan of that fish barrier? And how did you decide on that lifespan? On the lifespan, um, yeah. When is it going to crack? A uh, crack up and stuff like that. Well, I mean, eventually it's just gonna be it. It. You're right. Eventually, it will probably need some repair work and those kind of things. Um, I think that we designed it for. I want to say 100 years. Okay. And how is it? Uh, Yeah, um, you, good question. It's designed for a certain flow capacity, and what I didn't show you today is there's a big bypass constructed right along the edge of the, of the fish barrier so that you reach a certain flow, and most of the flow goes that way rather than over the barrier itself. Yep. So when you, when you design the flood plane, you know that is as also you said, it's really complex, and I, don't, I think we are doing a good job of so how big is the team or who are involved in, in doing that? Because it's, of course, a lot of engineering, but mm -hmm. they pay ecologists, people who are considering, well, there should be a little, I don't know, wetland, there should be mm -hmm. more meanders, or how is that whole thing operating? And my idea how it's just a question of... That's an interesting question. It's uh, Our first objective is to remove the tailings. Yeah. You know? Um, that's our design objective rather than it's a, it's a remedial action project and that's where all the funding is and then you fold restoration in in terms of the floodplain and the stream channel things. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it but like Clark Fork River might be a little bit different where you design your wetland, they, they've been designing wetland complexes first and then designing floodplains around that and, and a little bit different than what we would do is get rid of the tailings build your river and then add things in, add those restoration features in as they fit, you know. I don't know if that really answers your oh, question, yeah. but yeah, in terms of who does it and how do we do it, it's a design team, really. And uh, to be honest with you, like who, who I would have work on a floodplain, um, people that fish, people that know rivers, people that can envision what things are supposed to look like instead of people that may not have a lot of field experience, those kind of things. So yeah, it's, it's like, a, you know, the, the floodplain design and stuff, like once it's designed and I, I don't know, it's just envision it, actually building is kind of boring because I've already seen it. Yeah. 
but the contractors don't, they're not, they're not programmed like engineers or, or, or scientific people. They haven't seen it. So, so for them, I think it's more fun, but, um, but I, yeah, that is interesting that you took there that away. There used to be a footbridge uh, that went across uh, right there at the bend. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you know that little area, you could park your cars in there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there was a footbridge that went across Silver up to Creek. up to German Gulch Creek. Is that is that what you're referring uh, to? It wasn't that far back up the creek. Mm -hmm. It was uh, down from where German Gulch comes in. Mm -hmm. to, yeah. To Silver Bowl, down about I'd say about a mile. Yeah, yeah. So that that bridge is still in. Oh, it is. Yeah, and um, Greenway is actually working out agreements with the landowners for how to best access that bridge, so you can still go in there and walk up German Gulch. So. Um, and I, yeah, they, their intent is not to close that to the public for sure. So it's been locked up, you know, for yeah, I know it's a, three years now, I guess. Right, right. But I believe that 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 particular access is moving forward. So um, I think that instead of coming in like you did before, you'll come in on the old Milwaukee grade and then drop right down to that. So you'll bypass all the, the ranchers' property and stuff like that. But but that's in the works with, with Greenway and they're working on that with the landowner and things like that. So um, and then uh, one of our construction teams is doing a little bit of secondary cleanup on that access road probably within the next couple months just to the protect the plug from that. Still be there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, eventually I think that uh, you know, there may be a trailhead on that Fairmont Road to walk upstream and stuff like that. But um, all that stuff's in the works and you know, they just kind of follow us as we go. So, yeah. Sure. I understood that the pipe would be run outside the, the channel, but it looks like in some areas you rent right... Right down the middle of the channel, yes. Mm -hmm. How do you dredge underneath that for the toxic waste? Um, for the most part, in those areas, the channel itself is relatively clean because there's a fair amount of grade in the canyon. Mm -hmm. So as the, as the river's just washing all that, it's, it's actually washing that rock in. So you don't have the contaminants in the channel itself, but on the banks you have those deposits of tailings impacted soils. So that's where all the stuff has to come out is on the banks in those areas. Yeah, you bet. Uh, you were referred to the removal of the, uh, the actual tailings, mm -hmm. but what about native sediments that have been contaminated through leaching? I mean, that stuff's been yeah. for 100 years. Yep. Um, did you guys try to remove that? Or Absolutely. So I. There's, there's tailings, and then there's tailings impacted soils, which is just what you're talking about. So, like, like the slide I show you, like, the, the tailings itself, it's like, yeah, man, that's tailings, that's obvious. But sometimes, you know, what used to be, like, this awesome A horizon, just dark and humus and stuff like that, I mean, everything leaches right through the tailings, and that's where it sticks because it has a little bit more clay and stuff like that. So that is just as hot, if not hotter, than the tailings in a lot of cases. So what we do is we, we account for that in, in our designs. We go back through, we do field confirmation sampling to make sure that, hey, that, you know, we'll, we'll do, through XRF analysis, and we send that off to the lab and make sure we're right. But you're, you're right on the money there. It's, it's those, what used to be good is now bad, and that, that goes to, and then after that, we regrade the floodplain, and we haul in clean soils to place <clears throat> over that. And then uh, with your limited sampling before you started? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you might have compromised your, um, your accuracy at identifying those, those soils? Uh, yes, it was compromised. Okay. But to account for that in the field, you do a whole bunch more confirmation sampling, like a whole bunch. And you see how hard it was to go get it? We don't want to go back. So um, our design volume on this project was 220,000 cubic yards. What we took out of there, 467,000 cubic yards. So a lot more, a lot more than what was characterized or what we expected, you know? But through that additional confirmation sampling, we're making sure that we get it. And a lot of times we're digging to hard rock, you know? It's like, yeah, we got it, you know? So, yeah. Kind of a follow-up on that is, uh, were you able to use um, visual to sure, absolutely. I mean, you get, yeah, you get pretty good at it. The, the field guys get really good at visually saying, yeah, that's obviously tailings, especially if it's blue, you know, especially if you put your shovel in and it turns, you know, blue. So, yeah, copper. Um, but pretty rigid um, sampling protocol to make sure that we, we got it all and that we can 
not only say we got it all, but prove we got it all statistically. You know, there's a whole series of statistical analysis to make sure that we're doing just what you asked. You know, that's what we're there for. So, that. Was there any discussion of the, the pit overflowing and compromising all this hard work? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to answer. It's, you know, yeah, sure. It's a worry, for sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for coming.